Welcome to Ministry in Motion, where we explore best practices for your ministry in the 21st century. Whether you're a pastor or a volunteer in your local church, Ministry in Motion is designed to provide you with resources and to help you with your ministry. It's also designed to bring you closer to the Jesus at the basis of all ministry. I'm Anthony Kent and it's a real pleasure to welcome you to today's program. Today's program is all about making your sermon memorable. And our special guest today is Pastor Randy Roberts. Randy is the senior pastor of Loma Linda University Campus Church. Thanks so much for joining us, Thank Randy. Thank you, Anthony. Now, Randy, making a sermon memorable. It's one thing to prepare and craft with the Lord's help a grand sermon, <laughs> but if it's not remembered, if yes. it's not taken from, from the point of delivery, it's really lost, isn't it? Yes. Well, when I think about a sermon being memorable, I guess I think about that, first of all, as a listener, mm -hmm. as a worshiper in a church, what makes a sermon memorable to me? And I think to me, the two things that most likely make a sermon memorable are one, emotion of some kind, it has stirred some emotion within me. It has touched me emotionally in some way. Or two, on the other hand, it has a story or stories or is constructed in a story form in such a way that it more naturally lodges itself into my memory. I think both of those elements are very important in remembering. Why don't we look at each one of those in turn? Why don't we start with emotions? Mm -hmm. Because there are some positive things with emotions, mm -hmm. but they can be some negative things, particularly with manipulation of emotions. Right. So let's, let's look at emotions and how they can be used in the delivery of a sermon, making right. it memorable. May I say something maybe first just about emotion, period, and its attachment to memory. This is not my area of expertise, but I do understand from those who study memory that we are most likely to remember events that were somehow tied to some emotion in our lives, especially a deep emotion. The more mm -hmm. profound that was, the more likely we are to remember the event. I've been going through a book just recently on the assassination of President John F. Kennedy. And one of the things that people across this country, maybe even around the world, who were alive at that time will tell you is that they remember exactly where they were and exactly what they were doing when they heard the news that he had been assassinated because it was a deeply emotional event. Mm. That emotion attaches itself to the memory and we remember. I suspect the same is true with 9-11 here in the United States. We remember where we were when we first heard about the towers and so forth. On the other hand, very happy moments in our lives. We remember our wedding, mm. our wedding day, the birth of our children. Those are emotional moments and they, we remember them. So I think emotion, has a magnetic pull on memory. Now, what about that in terms of a sermon? Mm. I think healthy emotion is essential for the sermon, whereas emotionalism can be detracting from and destructive to the sermon. Now, how would you define those two? Well, let me start with emotionalism. Emotionalism is just trying to work people up into an emotion or use it manipulatively and not have a, a legitimate, authentic purpose for that. But emotion, we as human beings are created in emotional ways. Emotion is very important. Pastor Floyd Brzee, who used to work in the General Conference Ministerial Department, headed up, yes. used an illustration that has lodged itself in my mind and been very helpful in this regard, between emotion and logic. Mm -hmm. If we went sailing, and they gave us a half price on the boat, but we could only choose the rudder or the sail, would we take it? Well, some would, wanting to save some money. They would take only the sail, they'd get in the boat and be blown all over the lake, mm. have no control over where they're going. That's emotionalism. On the other hand, if you take away the sail and use only the rudder, you go nowhere. Yeah. That's the logic. So the sail and the rudder together are the e legitimate, healthy emotion tied to the logic, the thoughtfulness. The, the emotion will move us. It will keep us moving in a certain direction, but the logic, the word, will keep guiding us as we go forward. So laughter, tears, 
that grow naturally out of what's being communicated, grow naturally out of the text, mm. are healthy experiences. But if we're just getting up there to make them laugh, and at the end they've laughed all this, and say, that was a great sermon, they laughed all the way through. Well, like John Stott said, I never know anyone who laughed their way to the cross. Yes. You know, as, as a vehicle merely for its own purposes, uh, that's why you have stand-up comedy. That's the purpose of that. That's not the purpose of the sermon. On the other hand, when tears spring to one's eyes in the natural flow of what's happening, that can be a healthy response. I know of one preacher years ago who said to me, I'm going to have him crying in the aisles, and that was specifically his intent because that would tell him that he had done a good job. I think that's emotionalism and can be very damaging. Exactly. So when it flowed, you read the teaching of Jesus and it was there, the emotion was there. When it flows naturally out of what is being told as a natural response to the overall message, emotion is essential and powerful. Mm. And didn't Jesus tell emotional stories? Absolutely. The you know, parable of the prodigal son. Wow. The Good Samaritan, which would have drawn this kind of response from his mm. listeners, very negative emotion, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Now, that's a, a natural link for us between emotion and story. Right. That's the second way to help us remember that we're looking at so far. So, illustrations. Well, let me say something about story first, because a, a sermon can be constructed as a story mm -hmm. itself and not be a story. Story has basically three elements, situation, complication, resolution. Well, you can structure a sermon in that way, and that complication draws the listener in to hear, how's this going to come out? How's that going to be resolved? So that structure is there, even though it may not be just a story, and that helps the listener to follow. It will help them remember. Mm. Illustrations. We preachers develop, as I said one time earlier, voracious appetites for illustrative material, ways to illustrate. And there's a lot that we could talk about there, where to find them, how to use them, um, what kinds of illustrations. There's much that could be talked about. Well, there is, and I'd like to explore that, particularly where to find them mm -hmm. and good quality ones. Yes. And why don't we do that after this break? Okay, very All good. Right. We'll be right back with more of Ministry in Motion. Welcome back to Ministry in Motion. Our topic today is making your sermon memorable and our special guest, Pastor Randy Roberts. Now, Randy, we need to look at illustrations mm -hmm. because illustrations make our sermons memorable. Yes. What is an illustration? That's a great question because when, when we hear illustration, we most naturally jump to story. And story, without any question, is a vital part of what an illustration is. But I would draw a distinction, as some have drawn. For example, the homiletician Donald Sanukian draws this distinction, and I have found it very helpful, between illustration and application. An illustration can be a story. It can be sharing an event. It can be something along those lines. But that illustration doesn't always end up applying the truth literally to a person's life this week. An application will do that. So let me draw the distinction. An illustration might say... This last week, when I came into the office, and then, and then begins the story, whatever it is. An application, on the other hand, might take whatever it is that I'm talking about today, let's say it's caring for others, and give the listener a visual representation of how that will look. So that I might say, so this next week, as you walk out of your garage to take the trash to the curb, and you encounter that neighbor who lost her husband six weeks ago. And this sermon just flits through your mind. You'll have a choice to make. Will you walk over and engage her? How's it going? And mean that. Mm -hmm. Not just how are you doing fine, thank you, you both head back in, but will you mean that? Will you stand and listen, invite her in for something to drink, hold her as she weeps, and say, I'm here for you. That's an application because it's giving the listener a visual 
image of what it will mean to live this out. Now, sometimes you can bring them together, a story that actually does apply. But I would be careful about that distinction because sometimes we preachers think just because we've illustrated it, we've applied it. We haven't always done that. The story about Alexander the Great is not necessarily going to make any application to my life in Southern California in 2014. Mm. So illustration, application, both vital, vibrant parts of a sermon, but both necessary. Mm. So Randy, where do you find your best illustrations from? Assuming they're all good illustrations. <laughs> That's a big assumption. <laughs> you know, I am shameless, Anthony. I will find them anywhere I can mm -hmm. in reading, books of illustrations, internet, uh, maybe a television program, the news, my children, probably much to their chagrin, although I don't use any family illustrations without permission. Mm -hmm. Anywhere and people sending them to me from the congregation, anywhere and everywhere. Sometimes making them up. And let me say something careful about that because I want to be understood clearly. You can tag something to the illustration that clues the listener immediately into the fact that this isn't an actual event. If I say, like I said a moment ago, when I walked into the office this past Tuesday, people expect it to be factually correct. Mm -hmm. If I say, once upon a time in a faraway land, people immediately know this mm. is something that is not factually correct, you know, factually based. It's a story. So you can tag it with things like that that will, that will clue the listener. Dr. Fred Craddock says, one day he says, I walked out of the door and there was this 12-pound robin Robin? Robin, a bird, <laughs> struggling to walk down the street. And he said to the bird, why aren't you flying? He said, I can't. So what's your name? He said, church. <laughs> well, you know, that didn't actually happen. Yeah. But it makes the point. The way he told it, clued the listener. He didn't have to say, now, I didn't really see a robin that mm. was 12. He didn't have to say that because you know that yeah. as you listen to it. Yeah. So... All of those ways. Now, let me say something about books of illustrations or illustration websites that there exist on the computer. They can be helpful, and I use them, mm -hmm. but it is a process of sorting through 50 to 100 of them to find a good one. Yeah. And even when you find it, what I often find is true is that will then send me in search of the actual source, the actual story, which fills it out and which can make it more robust. Just lifting one off the page and putting it into the sermon typically will feel like that's exactly what happened. Mm. And so you have to be careful with that. But when someone is preaching on a weekly basis, you have to be continually attuned to be able to find the material necessary. Now, one thing that was suggested that has been helpful, I haven't done it as much as I want to do it. It's been a function of time, but when I have, it has been a gold mine. And that is to have a, a file in my computer entitled, What It's Like To, and then all different kinds of folders in there to be lonely, to say goodbye, to celebrate, to face death, and then just write a paragraph, write a page. Every time I see something like that happen, I was sitting at an airline reception area one day, not too long ago, had my computer out, and I just happened to look up, and I saw a mother saying goodbye to her son who was in service uniform. It was an extremely emotional moment. They had obviously allowed her to come all the way to the gate, which none of the rest of us get to do. Mm -hmm. And I just wrote that, what it's like to say goodbye to your son. And all I did was write out what I observed, use it later in a sermon, talk about emotion. I was in tears just remembering that moment. But I would have lost it mm -hmm. had I not just sat there and said, what it's like to say goodbye to your child. So those kinds of things, always being attuned to that. Memorable language can be very important. You actually will have to illustrate less if you use vivid language, strong verbs. Don't tell people how to feel about something, just describe the scene. For example, I could say, Haman walked into the room where 
Esther was, and then now Haman was a bad guy, and you would have hated him and all that. I'm telling the listener how to feel. What about if I just use one strong verb? Haman slithered into the room. Mm. And right there, you already know, this guy's a snake, man. Yeah, yeah. Watch out for him. It's just one word. Finding strong verbs, strong language, memorable wording can be extremely helpful in people remembering a sermon and also entering into the natural emotion of it. Mm. So again, it's that link of emotion <coughs> with story once again. Right, Something Absolutely. that Jesus did, something that makes a sermon very memorable. Correct. Okay. Now there's some other components, particularly in terms of delivery, mm. that make a sermon memorable. Mm -hmm. And I'd love to explore that a little, a little with you as well. Absolutely. Why don't we do that after this break? Okay. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Ministry in Motion. Today's topic is making your sermon memorable and our special guest, Pastor Randy Roberts. Now, Randy, we've looked at the place of emotion mm -hmm. and using that appropriately. Mm -hmm. We've looked at the place of story and mm -hmm. illustration. Mm -hmm. Now, delivery style mm. can make sermons memorable as well. Right. Do you mind if I just share a brief illustration? Sure. I can remember as a, a young teenager at a very special meeting, there were two speakers, C.D. Brooks, yes. who's a very powerful, right. loud, right. extraordinary preacher. Right. And then there was Morris Venden. Oh, wow. And, you know, Morris Venden was quite a contrast. Right. I remember both of their messages. Yes. Both of them were very memorable for different ways. Yes. Explore with us, will you, the, the importance of delivery. Absolutely. I think it has a lot to do with integrity, natural integrity. And what I mean by that is there has to be integrity or a sense of wholeness between who the preacher is and how he or she delivers the sermon. In other words, if I know that person, I ought to recognize them. Mm -hmm. Now, that doesn't mean that there isn't greater movement or greater projection of voice and so forth. That's called for, that has to happen when you're speaking to a crowd of people. But what you don't want is to look and say, who is that? Yeah. I've never seen that person before, you know? There has to be a sense of integrity. This is truly who I am. Yeah. Now, what about um, proximity to the people? Mm. And yes. building some connections there. That is, I am convinced that's an extremely important word in our culture, proximity, naturalness, closeness, connectedness, intimacy. Mm. Now, when I went as a seminary student to Andrews University in Berrien Springs, Michigan, I got there to the church on campus, Pioneer Memorial Church, and there was this grand pulpit up there. I mean, it looked like the bow of a <laughs> ship up there. The preacher would rise up into that and be mm -hmm. above all the congregation. And I thought, man, it must be a heady place to preach. It's way up there. It kind of called to mind the crow's nest from which the preachers in Europe, if you go back to those cathedrals from yesteryear, climb all the way up in those steps, and then they are 10 feet above their congregation, can look down on them. That's not our culture. Mm. Our culture requires closeness connection, intimacy with the person up front, emotionally as well as physically. Because of that, to me, it appears very important. Now, I, I want to say this carefully, Anthony, because I have respect for the integrity of people doing it in the way that fits them best. To use an Old Testament metaphor, you've got to fight in your own armor. Surely. You can't yeah. fight in King Saul's armor. I accept that. But, for me, that means nothing between me and the people. No pulpit. In fact, my good friend Dwight Nelson removed that pulpit at Pioneer Memorial Church, that grand pulpit, and now it's a plexiglass lectern. Mm -hmm. So if you use some kind of a lectern, have it be something like that. It's basically see-through. It's unobtrusive. Uh, people don't notice. It doesn't feel like you're hiding back there, and all they can see is from about here up, and they can't see anything else. So that kind of proximity that connects with them, that feels like that person is here. 
A second thing, in our church congregation, we do not, except in very rare instances, primarily graduations, we do not have the worship leaders sitting up front. They sit down in the congregation, move up to the front, and then move back down. Mm -hmm. Now, part of that, people say, was that your media-driven culture or whatever? The answer is no, it's not. For me, that is a theological statement that says the worship leaders are part of this body of Christ. Mm -hmm. When we are called upon to move up to do something, we ascend from the body and we return to it. Mm -hmm. We're a part of this. It's that proximity to the people to whom we minister again. That's important, isn't it? I think it's very important yeah. in our culture mm. especially. Mm. But I think it's a theological reality as well. The one who took on flesh came to be among us, one of us, a part of who we are. So I think it's a theological, a theological statement as well. And then finally, a proximity emotionally to the people. Time was when a preacher could stand up and be fairly bombastic, fairly impervious to what he himself was delivering. It was he in those days. Mm -hmm. And be above it and untouched by it. I think if you follow the successful communicators in our day and time, that is no longer true. People want to know, how did this affect you? Mm. Do you live with this? Has it gone through your heart and through your life? Has it made any difference there? Which I think calls for, for what would I call it, appropriate authenticity. The pulpit is not a confessional. Yeah. It's not a place, it's not a therapist's couch. It, and it should never be that. But neither is it an ivory tower. Of Jesus, it is written, he was touched with the feelings of our infirmities. He can relate. He was tempted in all points as we are, yet without sin. So we don't get up there and, and tell all the gritty, grimy details of what we've struggled with this week. But I think we do say, I know whereof I speak. Mm. I, I face these temptations. Mm. And, and, and at times of failure, I have bowed before him in repentance. And at times of success, I have sung his praises. But I know this passage, it has been through my life in whatever the appropriate way is that week. I think that kind of proximity becomes very important too. Mm. Um, so, so the proximity has to do with naturalness of delivery. It has to do also with a, an awareness of the culture around us and what that calls for. And it has to do with authenticity of person. You know, as I'm listening to you, Randy, it's, it's valuable because I'm thinking, what makes a sermon memorable? Emotions, mm. stories, mm -hmm. illustration, proximity. Mm -hmm. And isn't that the message of the Bible? Yes, the message of Jesus. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Did you know? And so essentially, it's pro proclaiming and presenting Jesus. Yes, amen. And, and what he is and mm -hmm. who he is. Thanks so much. Thank Randy. you, Anthony. It's, it's been, been a, a wonderful pleasure to, to just listen thank to you. you. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. And we want to thank you as well. We trust that you've been blessed and enriched by this program, Ministry in Motion. Come and visit us on our website, ministryinmotion.tv. There's an array of resources there that will bless your ministry. But until next time, may God richly bless you and bye for now.